Hi, and welcome to the BAFTA Games live stream, live from Creative Assembly. Uh, I'm Dave, I'm a senior sound designer here at CA, and this is John, our principal sound designer on the Total War Audio team. Um, we've joined up with BAFTA Games uh, for this live stream as part of their BAFTA Crew Games program, uh, which is a network for those currently working in the games industry uh, to have access to BAFTA award-winning talent and nominees. Um, and we're going to tell you about managing complexity in game audio uh, within the scope of Total War. Um, if you're not familiar with Total War, think uh, turn-based strategy combined with massive scale real-time strategy battles, um, which can get fairly complex, as it says on the tin. Uh, and to cope with that, we've got a fairly large audio team uh, here at Creative Assembly. We've got a music department, we've got dialogue, uh, sound design, we've got audio programmers, um, we've got audio QA, and we've got an audio administrator. And we see the games are complex, and another reason for that is, uh, for having such a large team, is uh, that we work on many Total War games at a time, usually. Um, but without going into too much detail on that yet, we're just going to show you uh, what a typical battle in Total War Warhammer 2 might look like, which uh, we've got a little video prepared that our brand team uh, were kindly enough to help us out with. So here it goes. So you can see there's a lot going on. You've got hundreds, even thousands of individual soldiers. You've got crazy creatures of all different sizes. You've got wizards, magic spells, crazy war machines and vehicles driving around. Um, so it's a lot and you've, we've got a free camera as well that we have to deal with. Uh, so everything has to blend at any time into all these different perspectives and uh, contexts of what goes on in these real-time battles. Um, so essentially we've got three pillars to deal with that. Uh, first off, we have to limit our input, uh, basically what goes into the sound engine before it even deals with it. We use uh, WISE as our audio middleware, and if, if you're familiar with it, you know that it's incredibly powerful, incredibly useful engine. But because uh, Total War is such a niche thing in terms of genre, there are certain things we have to add to WISE. Uh, to get the most out of our games. And one of these things is uh, limitation. You might have heard of that concept as instance limiting, voice culling, event limiting, anything like that. Basically, we make sure uh, that only the sound triggers we need go into WISE in the first place um, to optimize the mix and the performance of the game. Um, we also add group sounds to it to uh, properly represent the 
size and scope of these battles, uh, which you couldn't necessarily do with just animation-driven individual sounds. Um, and then we have a whole uh, raft of different mixing systems, uh, proprietary, proprietary mixing systems, uh, to help contextualize things as well and deal with specific unique situations that can arise in these battles. Um, but let's start at the most granular level. Um, here's a shot of a typical battle as well. Uh, so you can see there's a lot going on in the background. You have your dwarfs and high elves, in this case, fighting. Uh, loads of soldiers in the background, there's a little helicopter, all kinds of stuff. Uh, but as the player, if you're looking at this, what you're really looking at um, are the two heroes in the foreground fighting. So you want all the detail of that, right? You want to hear their footsteps on the appropriate ground type. Um, you want to hear Foley for the type of armor they're wearing. You want to hear their weapons. You want to hear their battle screams, all of that. You don't really care about the background in great detail. Um, so a lot of what we do in terms of limiting our sounds is uh, finding a balance between detail and clutter, um, which for this scene might be simple enough if you want to focus on these two heroes, you get rid of everything else. But because we have a free camera, uh, the player can basically, within a moment's notice, switch to something like this where all of a sudden, you know, you're looking at thousands of individual units and they all do have all these animation triggers for all the ground types, footsteps, all the foley, all the little grunts and breaths. Uh, but if you played all of these in this perspective, it would sound an absolute mess. Um, not to mention performance would be an issue. So that's why um, we limit our sounds as appropriately as we can uh, before we even touch wise at all. Um, and that um, does help with mixed focus a great deal um, and also with performance and our virtual voice count because WISE does have a very powerful um, playback limit system which we do use as well actually um, but we do have to go beyond that at some at certain points because uh, even though WISE uh, does kill sounds if they don't need to be played right now they, they uh, there's still some calculations that need to be made like positioning and things like that that uh, with just the enormous input that comes from a total war battle uh, the game just can't cope with that and to illustrate that point we asked our programmers to um, basically disable our custom limitation tech uh, in a very very heavy Total War Warhammer 2 battle, and we will show you what that sounds like. So that's not great. Um, the yellow flickering text you're seeing is essentially Wise's uh, playback limiting system in action, uh, all these triggers come in and they exceed the playback limits, and but they do get killed all the time because they keep coming in and it has to calculate positions and things like that all the time. So the game just cannot deal with the amount of things coming in, which is why we limit that as much as we can before anything goes into WISE. Um, and we do that uh, with limitation groups. Basically what we want to achieve is uh, we want to limit our sounds um, per game entity rather than per type of sound. So your typical Y setup that, that we use as well would be you might have a bus for your Foley sounds, you might have a bus for your weapon sounds, for your footsteps, and you set your max values there or on a, on a child level. Uh, but because in Total War entities, game soldiers essentially might share animations and the sound tags associated with them, um, we want to be able to limit per those entities. So for example, uh, a hero character might have the same footsteps or weapon sounds as a generic foot soldier. Um, so going back to that image from earlier, we want to make sure that on the hero character, we always hear all the details, all the footsteps, all the armor, foley, everything. But with a generic soldier who's usually one out of 500 on screen, uh, we don't absolutely do not want all that detail because if there really are that many it's just absolute clutter and mess um, but if we limit that per entity uh, we can maintain the same sounds the same animations uh, 
and still have the detail versus clutter balance that we want. Um, so we color our voices based on that and also based on their maximum attenuation distance. This is again something that WISE does as well um, and will kill a voice or send it virtual uh, as it exceeds the audible range. Uh, but for that it obviously has to first calculate that, calculate the position, the distance to the listener and all of that. Uh, so we want to preempt that and basically before anything goes into WISE set that and and cull anything that's outside of that range to which saves an enormous amount of you know, memory and, and improves performance um, and then the third step with uh, these limitations is we can scale them as well essentially we can choose to play a sound on a percentage of entities in a pool um, basically you want a small scale on something like foliar footsteps right you you will only want to hear that on the closest four entities in front of the camera melee grunts that's a bit more important so we can scale it up maybe six entities around the camera and then melee screams where you get into sort of visual sync territory uh, becomes more important so maybe you scale it up even a bit more you play it around the 10 closest entities to the camera um, so that's pretty much everything that happens before we enter WISE and we optimize performance. But we do also use uh, our limitation system specifically for mixing. Uh, for example, we scale our attenuations, which again, going back to the example of um, having the same sound used on a hero character and on a foot soldier, um, without having to duplicate the sounds and the animations and the tags and everything, we can simply say, well, if this sword hit is used on a hero, then I want to hear it further out, you know, give you at certain perspectives additional detail and just ensure that you're hearing the hero over all the generic grunts. Um, and the other way around, into wise, we can also simply mix a sound according to its entity, to its group, um, using Wise's uh, real-time parameter control we can, again, if, if that weapon sound is used by a hero, it's always a little bit louder, for example, than when it's used by a foot soldier. And in action, it sounds like this. This is a skirmish from the initial video um, with only our individual sounds playing, and this time with our limitation tech enabled. <laughs> So that's nice and tidy. Uh, we're getting a good balance between detail and clutter as we want to, but it, it doesn't quite have the size and the weight that you would expect from a battle like that. Um, so as a consequence of the way we're limiting our sounds, um, our individual animation driven sounds, we introduce as our second pillar uh, a group system. Basically we add um, bespoke designed group sounds in certain situations so to represent uh, the mass and size and scale of these battles. Basically, movement an example. If, if you've got a lot of soldiers moving at the same time, um, you add um, a design group movement sounds for, for different speeds, different ground types. Uh, we can have bespoke group sounds for foley, different armor types, uh, melee, different weapon types. And very importantly, we have uh, group vocalization sounds. Um, that's a very important thing for Total War, especially for uh, our historical titles, because um, in, in the Warhammer series, we have a lot of, you know, crazy flavor already. You have all these fantasy races and cultures and creatures and magic spells uh, with historical titles. Um, these vocalizations can really help uh, characterize your faction or your culture that you're working with uh, and give it much, much more flavor. Um, and the way this is set up is, is sort of a many-layered um, system. In the first step, we decide, well, when do we even want to play uh, group vocalizations? We decide which situations need to use that system. So, for example, an obvious one is units in melee, right? If you've got a large number of soldiers fighting each other, we add group vocalizations for that, screaming, grunting, 
we might have <clears throat> an encouragement layer cheering for the guys behind the guys that are fighting. We might have one shot group sounds for charging, for units colliding with each other. We might have pain group vocalizations for units being hit by a barrage of arrows. Um, we might have taunting, chanting, or if your unit is being defeated, we might have a group sound for routing. Um, and again, keeping in mind the free camera and all the different perspectives and sizes you might have, um, we start this whole thing still with individual vocalizations. So you've already heard our animation driven ones that are synced to an individual soldier uh, and their anims. Um, we also add to that what we call incidental vocalizations. Basically, that's also a single soldier screaming, um, but it's not tied to visual sync. It's not based on an animation. It's there to um, give you some additional context or flavor or to combat hearing fatigue. For example, we have incidental shouts in there uh, that are tied to the game's morale parameter. So there's a little detail that at a certain perspective will tell you, oh, is my unit losing the skirmish right now? Is it winning? How are the guys doing without being on the nose with it? It's just a nice little detail to help sell the soundscape. Um, but then as soon as you start having sort of more than four or five individuals doing their melee screams, it starts sounding thin and, and not appropriate for what you're seeing. So that's when we start adding our uh, unit-based group sounds. Say you've got five or six people fighting, we will add a small-sized group sound to that on top of our individual sounds to give it some weight and, and some heft. Um, you approach sort of a unit size of 25 or more, we blend that into a medium-sized group sound and from something like 75 maybe, uh, we blend that into a large group sound and that again free camera um, as you zoom out that might as well change into a distant version or have some processing to take out some of the detail um, and then again keeping distance in mind um, we can also merge these essentially if you're at a sort of medium distance you might have a medium sized unit fighting on the one side a medium sized unit fighting on the other side um, and that's appropriate at a certain perspective, but as you zoom out, uh, as you move the camera away, that can visually sort of turn into one distant blob of units fighting rather than two medium-sized detailed ones. So at that point, we just merge what we've got um, and replace our two medium-sized units turn into one large-sized one, which on the one hand, creatively, it represents much better what you're seeing on the screen and it also again helps us with performance and memory because we're all of a sudden we're, instead of two sounds we're playing just one that's appropriate for what you're seeing and um, with the kinds of distances our cameras travel uh, we have to take this even further um, basically at the sort of maximum distance where you would still hear vocalizations we enter what we call the background fill layer that's sort of an almost ambience like uh, distant battle roaring screaming soundscape um, and the way this works is again we distill the detail down into something less granular so our small medium large sized units uh, filter down into looser categories like uh, is it human male units human female uh, is it a low frequency big bassy creature is it a screechy high frequency creature that sort of thing and again it represents better what you're seeing uh, off in the distance and you save a ton of voices again because you're dropping all of your individual unit groups um, and replace it with this background fill. So you can imagine that an approach like this takes a lot of content uh, to make that work. And when our sound designer, Charlie Pateman overhauled um, the group vocalization system a while back. He also changed the way uh, we record these sounds. Um, the backbone of it is essentially outdoor recordings with 20 plus performers. Um, we do this outdoors because we feel that you can't quite get that sound with just digital signal processing. Uh, it's nothing quite like 20 people screaming at the top of their lungs uh, in a field somewhere. So we try to do that whenever we can and we'll use various kinds of microphones at different perspectives to get all the different source material types that we need to design our group sounds. Um, what also really helps with these kinds of recordings um, is 
Charlie would set people up in a formation, essentially. Um, let's say you have four rows of five people each, and that way you can say you're recording a, a charging scream. Uh, you do that a couple of times with that whole group, and then you can easily say, oh, use rows one and three to do the same thing, then use rows two and four to do the same thing, and then you might want to play musical chairs with your people, switch their individual positions around, and you go through that thing again. That gives you a remarkable amount of variation for what, you go, what you're going for, um, which is very important for all the different sounds that we need to author. But because we have to yet again keep uh, perspective in mind and our free camera, um, we also add different levels of detail for when you might need them. So for example, we record similar types of things with smaller clusters of people in the studio and also individual performers just to be able to add things, drop things in and out of the mix when the perspective is appropriate for them. And yeah, all of that recording gives us a huge palette to work with for all the different cultures, fantasy races, all the different perspectives and situations that we need. So long story short, uh, before we show you what that sounds like, here's a quick refresher of just the individual sounds again. Yeah, so as before, it's nice and tidy, it's decluttered, um, but it doesn't have that heft. Uh, so here's that same skirmish again with our group sounds layered underneath all of the individuals. And, and that's not just group vocalizations, that's also um, group movement, group foley, group weapon impacts and all the rest of it. So that's a much better representation of, of what you're seeing. Um, but because it's not just these large groups uh, fighting in total war, uh, especially on in the Warhammer series, you have all these other creatures, magic spells, vehicles, everything. Um, we have our third pillar, which is a number of proprietary mixing systems to deal with certain situations. And John's going to tell you all about these. Hello. Um, thanks, Dave. Good job, man. Um, so yeah, welcome to um, the second part of the talk. Uh, this is going to be how we deal with like uh, all the sounds in the mix going off at the same time. Well, hopefully not after we've limited them down a little bit, but there we go. Um, so yeah, in a game like Total War, um, you know, a lot of the time the player is going to be at the kind of the wide strategic kind of uh, sort of eagle eye view of the battlefield. So most of what they're going to be hearing at that level is obviously music if they've got music enabled. Um, they've got the group vocalizations, they've got the cheering, the taunting, um, the, all the melee sounds that happen at a distance and that fill sound that's obviously in there for, for there. They've got ambience as well. So obviously the rule about, you know, any any audio mix is, you know, you want to really try and create difference over time, you know, really sort of, you know, the ear latches onto continuous sounds like very, very quickly in the mix. So that's part of the reason we've got those sort of incidental one shots in the crowd, in the crowd system. Is so that you know you don't get that ear fatigue you know with continuous sounds so you know we always want to try and clean up the mix as, as best we can in terms of you know what's constantly playing what other challenges we got well we've got very large entities and these can happen like in groups of creatures or very loud sort of individual creatures like dragons or you know really big monsters or war machines and We've also got the additional challenge of, you know, we can, the player can put the camera wherever they want on the battlefield. You know, they can zoom right in, they can, you know, be off on one corner of the map, they can be, you know, anywhere like. And we've also got obviously people spectating in multiplayer. So the game's got to kind of sound good wherever the player puts the camera as best, you know, as best as we can make it sound. And we also, you know, what other systems do we need to create for making sort of, you know, moments of punch in the mix and cinematic effects like you'd want to do in a film as well, we try. So um, first off, moving on for the sort of group vocalization system. Um, so what's important in the mix with the group vocalizations? Well, you know, obviously these, you've got the camera in 3D space, you've got 
lots of action going on around you, but we really want the player to focus on primarily is what is going on within the field of view. So what we want to do is essentially like draw a circle in the center of the screen and then as things get closer to the center of the screen, we want to prioritize those over stuff that goes towards the edge of the screen and beyond. So here's an example of sort of two groups coming together and if you keep an eye on some of the parameters that are moving around, it's all in slow motion, it will give you an idea of what's going on. So we've got the first group approaching and as, as they meet, other group sounds will start spinning up and those will include sort of things like charge sounds and collision sounds and things like that. And you'll notice in the blue text, the ones closest to the camera have got a slightly higher value to the ones towards the edge of the screen, towards the blue circle there. And what that's doing essentially is we're sending a parameter down into Wise. And so the closest group sounds are, are louder, um, less filtered than the ones in the back. So that immediately starts pulling focus towards the stuff that's um, drawing your eye at any one time. So that deals with some of the group situations. Um, the other kind of thing we've got going on is obviously, you know, they've got music playing and in Warhammer, it's a very, very lush uh, orchestral score. So it's containing a lot of frequency range to work with and it's very, very dynamic and situational based on, you know, what's going on within the battle. So the music can be quite, um, you know, can be sparse and in a threat situation where two armies are yet to engage. It can also really ramp up like when there's barrages of artillery or magic or when the fighting is really heavy as well. So, you know, the music texture can change dynamically, the volume can change dynamically, and how do we kind of massage the sound effects around the, the music and massage the music around the sound effects? So, typically what we do, as the music level increases, stuff like the continuous group sounds, like the encouragement, the cheering, um, the taunting and stuff, that gets sort of quite heavily side-chained against the music. So you, you're removing all those continuous competing sounds against things like you know strings and brass and things like that um, when they don't need to be so important so quite a, a distance away from the action um, those sounds are getting quite quite lowered in the mix as we move forward in into towards a, a skirmish or so we're backing off the music a little bit and leaving a bit more room for those things to poke through conversely to you know keep that impression of size and scale we're turning up the one shots things like you know uh, the pain group vocalizations and the charges, which are very, very important for player feedback. So, you know, you want to hear if your unit has just got taken out by, you know, a barrage of uh, cannonballs or whether one unit is charging another, that kind of thing. So those kind of one shot sounds are quite important in the mix to get the, the player's attention. So we tighten them up slightly, um, which you know makes the, the battle also feel more lively as well as a consequence. And one of the, the brilliant things about the group system with the incidentals tied to morale and things like that is those those little one shots that you get in the group system. Um, because we've turned down the fill essentially that's like, you know, anything that can compete with the music, there's more space to turn up the sort of the bits of flavour and detail. So, you know, to compensate for the fill going, we let the detail come up in the mix a bit more. So the idea is, yep, static fill gives way to the music and creates space for all these one shots to poke through. And here's so here's a vocalization example with just vocalizations. So we've got all those perspectives working, you know, you've got the uh, distance perspective giving way to the animation driven sounds and all the one shot group collisions, charging, that kind of stuff. And then this is what happens when we put the music in and we get rid of the background fill, anything that's continuous and we highlight on the those one shot bits of group vocalizations.
Cool. So you should be able to hear a difference in in those situations where you know there's there's less com less sound competing with the music, but you're getting actually more detail coming through as a consequence of that because you know you can hear the little bit of one shot detail coming through a bit better. So next up, um, what else can we do with music? Um, so rather than take you know a, sort of an old school approach to to music side chaining um, and just ducking music when loud things happen on the screen. Um, we've taken a more sort of organic approach and looked at sort of the frequency bands of the music and what can we do when we've got those things isolated. So essentially we're looking at the low end and the high end um, and we're going to meter these things in real time to see what's going on with the music. Are there kind of bassy elements in the music, the high frequency elements in the music and we're also going to do this with sort of key areas of sound, of sound effects such as magic or projectiles, things that might contain like a, a lot of bass or a lot of high end. So what that allows us to do is, you know, when there's competing stuff in the sound effects, such as projectile impacts or magic, particularly in the low frequencies, we can duck the low frequencies in the music while maintaining the overall sort of balance of the music where it is. And conversely, when there's a lot of, sort of content in the high frequency in the music, we can get rid of all the kind of ancillary sound that we don't need when there's music playing, such as, you know, uh, wind and rain, for example, good, good examples of high frequency content. So again, just trying to remove as much competing frequencies as possible. Um, here is an example of the frequency metering going on. So hopefully that gives you an example of like how music is shaped and how sound effects are shaped depending on what's going on. Um, cool. So I guess one of the next major systems that we developed um, over you know the last sort of nine months or so um, would be our focus system. And critically, like why do we need a focus system in the first place? Well, so we have a lot of very loud stuff in Warhammer. Um, has to be said. Um, we've got multiple instances of an entity per unit so you can have like three chariots in a unit or you know typically three pieces of artillery in a unit um, on ultra it's four you know so we need to scale with the gameplay considerations um, and we can have things like vehicles that have got engine loops and we can have sort of groups and of units of very loud creatures you know maybe 15 to 24 of these things um, and we can also have situations where a player brings in, you know, they can have a dragon, for example, they can also bring in up to 19 dragons, I think it is, at any one time. So, and we can't represent all of these dragons with the group sound that we would do with vocalizations because they're all independent, they can be controlled, you know, um, given orders to move all over the map in different ways, but also, you know, come together on screen at one time. So we can't represent them too well with group sounds, particularly because they're, they're very, you know, large and visual sync's quite, um, Key, you know, even from a distance, these these loud creatures, you know, are obvious, you know, when they when they make noise. So, the particular challenge that we've got with these very loud entities is, you know, the player can bring in one dragon to a game at a time, and it has to sound good as it is within the mix as a whole. But the player can also bring in sort of, you know, four dragons at once, and when they're all on screen at one time, they really shouldn't dominate the mix too much uh, or muddy things. And that is the challenge with the focus system. So how do we deal with things? So we typically might say we're going to put every type of dragon into a focus pool that deals with dragons. And what we're going to do is score them at runtime, depending on a bunch of sort of considerations we want to make. So you know, how close is it to the camera? How close is it to the center of the, the view of the camera? And critically, is it moving or in combat, you see? So we want to basically score all these things depending on where they are and what they're doing. Um, once we've got our score, we can work out, well, the highest scoring entity gets essentially no mix change and all the other ones get 
varying degrees of of ducking in the mix depending on you know what its relative score is and particularly like what its relative distance is as well so and in such situations we can aggressively duck particularly engines and things so they're not competing as much um, and filtering off the low end and things like that to, to really clean up the mix and the aggression obviously has to tie into a min and max distance from the camera so when you're zoomed out it's not doing a lot of work to the mix but when you really zoomed in and the sounds become louder and more you know competing with each other that's when you really want to hear this system working so here it is in practice um, I'm I'm tempted to talk over this one, but I will just let the system speak for itself. So there's, there's two examples there. So the very front end of that video, the focus system was off with these doom wheels. So um, what you were hearing was lots of engines all competing with each other at the same time. And then when we enabled the system, um, as you span the camera around, depending on which one was closer, when they're all doing the same thing, which is being idle, um, it's the one that's closest to the camera that's most important. But then as soon as sort of I moved that third unit away from the camera, it, when it starts moving, it pulls the focus from the other ones. So the other ones start getting a bit turned down in the mix that one comes up in the mix so your ear really latches onto the one that's moving um same deal with the uh, the creatures there there's a lot of sounds playing on those guys they've got engines they've got like lightning effects when they're in combat and stuff um, they've got a lot of vocalizations going on so it really helps to be able to kind of focus on one thing at a time in the mix when you know particularly the same kinds of sounds are competing with each other Cool, so moving on to our last bit of tech that we want to talk about today is our interactive mixing using a concept called dynamic balance. Um, and why is it important that we need to have a concept of dynamic balance within a game like Total War? Um, well, the reason for that is we've got, Total War's a bit different in terms of its perspective and free camera from a lot of traditional games which might use concepts such as HDR mixing, for example. Um, in games like first person shooters you've got basically essentially a fixed perspective most of the time um, so HDR works really really well with a fixed perspective um, what it's essentially doing is side chaining sounds depending on its its relative volume its logical volume um, so when things like gunfire goes off uh, or explosions um, things like you know quieter sounds like ambient stuff you know get react to those loud sounds in the mix and it helps maintain quite an even volume um, for gameplay um, Whereas in Total War, we've got a free camera, so we can move it wherever we like. Um, if we've got really loud sounds, chances are we're quite far away from them, so HDR is not going to be working. If we start unrealistically playing with a logical volume of a lot of sounds, then you could get mixed problems when you're close up as well. Um, but what we really want to do is to be carving space out around loud events dynamically as the gameplay is going on, things like explosions and magic, for example. Um, we also want to be making contextual ducking based on whether we're clicking on the unit, we're giving it sort of movement orders, things like that. Um, we want to be doing ducking around important entities like the lords, for example. Like we always want to hear in the mix where our lord is, where an important creature is, for example. And we might also want to do some cool cinematic effects for you know important animation-driven stuff like there's a cryptus that I'll show you in a bit, and it does a shockwave attack, and when that goes off. Um, 
it basically has to, you know, to make even more of a ducking effect in the mix, we want to trigger one of these sort of dynamic mix conditions when that happens. And particularly it's useful, um, we can talk about it now, because <laughs> <laughs> previously we couldn't talk about it because it hadn't been released, but um, we, we mixed um, the game around Warhammer 2 based on, you know, what our loudest creature would be at that point, and that I think it was the Hellpit or the Carnosaur was one of the loudest creatures at that point. And obviously over time we've had progressively bigger and bigger creatures um, to deal with, culminating in the last release which was the, um, the Dreadsaurian, which is the la largest dinosaur that we've we've had or probably can imagine in a game of Total War. <laughs> so we'd obviously set our mixing stall out, you know, to deal with, you know, dragons and dinosaurs and things, but then suddenly a huge one comes along and, and where do you go from there in terms of, you know, carving out even more space in the mix. So this is where a dynamic mixing system really helps um, keep a mix under control and give the impression of loudness by turning down stuff around important moments in the mix. Um, another good reason for doing this outside of WISE is, you know, if we want to do things like azimuth um, mixing, um, incorporating this within a dynamic mixing environment. So we, you know, as sounds go off screen and become less important, we want to, you know, drop them in the mix. We don't want to be stacking WISE's internal azimuth parameter control. Um, on top of another mixing system. So we take that outside of WISE and then put that into our dynamic mixing system, which gives us a bit more finer control over the relative volume of stuff you know, inside or outside the field of view. Um, also depending on what's going on with magic and explosions and things like that. So it's quite a powerful technique to do a lot of dynamic mixing very, very quickly, um, depending on the context of what's going on in the game. So this is what a typical sphere might look like on a spell. On a spell, sorry. Um, so we've got the spell going off in the background. It's that kind of flashy thing in the middle. And if you can imagine when that goes off, it's essentially creating a, a bubble like at the center of this thing. And anything within that bubble is gonna get affected by, by this sphere. Um, and so it's not gonna affect its own sounds like the spell going off, but it's gonna affect anything within the range of this thing going off. Also what we might do is a good example. Here's one of the monsters about to do its um, big roar effect and you can see it says dynamic balance like on the Charybdis pain long start thing. It says that that's 0.96 or what, what does that mean? And it's all relative to the scale of one so it's pretty much the most important thing going on at that time but you can see on the things like Skaven encouragement that's down at 0.39 so when that sphere's gone off it's dramatically dropping the volume of all that stuff going on in the foreground because we've decided at that point that the Charybdis is really important and we're going to use that as a bit of a sort of a punch in the mix just to add a bit of preemptive ducking which is something you can't do with HDR easily as well it's like we can drop a sphere in the game to bit to make a bit of space before something loud happens which is it's a quite nice thing to be able to do so the benefits of this over HDR is we can essentially say there's going to be a min and max radius of effect so we can scale the amount of ducking that goes on depending on where the camera is and where the units are relative to that. So the sphere goes off close to some units, it's going to affect those units more than say units that are 100 meters away and less important. So essentially when you're looking at it, the mix top down, it's creating a bit of space around the important bit in the mix, like bit off the one side to the left, and it's not going to affect the stuff that's happening on the right so much. So all the time it's just moving the stereo field around quite a bit. It's quite nice to happen in the mix. Um, and we can also lessen the effect of this whether it's in the field of view or not. So if it goes off behind you, it's not going to duck stuff that's like right in front of you in the camera. So rather than get any really weird mix effects that happen where you might be looking at a group fighting, for example, and one of these spheres goes off behind you, well, it's not going to affect the stuff that you're looking at because you know we can say it's less important when it's behind you. Um, these spheres also need some form of priority and grouping so when lots happen at once it decides which is the most important one and it's going to do that in that area rather than just stack all these values together and they also need a concept of match combat so that when two creatures fight each other in match combat and um, they're each trying to trigger a sphere it's um, they're not affecting each other's sounds that they're fighting rather than you know they consider them as like one entity at that point rather than a sphere goes off on a dragon that's fighting a large dinosaur. Um, we don't want the dinosaur's vocalisation to be turned down just because the dragon's fighting it um, at that time. So that sounded a bit weird when 
all this ducking is going on for no apparent reason. <laughs> so here we go. Here's the sphere of infants working in practice. So we had a bit of a sphere of infants going on when those explosions go off in the foreground. But the more aggressive one for the magic spell goes off in the background and then we immediately get that sort of pregnant pause before the, you know, while the spell's just kicking off. So that gives you a bit of a nice hole in the mix at that point. Add a bit more drama. So, yep, at that point it's going off. It's, again, it's ducking everything in the foreground that's going on and not affecting its own sound so much. Um, so you could still hear the effect of the spell going off on the, um, uh, the stuff really close up to the thing but it's actually ducking the foreground quite a bit at that point to make a lot more space in the mix for it. Cool. Whew. Managing complexity <laughs> in game audio. It's fun. Do it. It's, it's a good career to have. <laughs> Come join us. Um, so the topics we've covered, like uh, so voice culling and imitation, that's the sort of core backbone of what we need to do for an RTS game with the kind of camera that we've got. Um, the group system again, that's, you know, quite key to um, the kind of perspectives that we've got. Um, how we mix groups, basically the spotlight system, side chaining and frequency based ducking. How do we deal with sound effects versus music? Um, and then basically how we deal with lots of loud stuff in the game. Yeah, so uh, we've got loads of great questions already. Thanks everybody for sending them in. Uh, I'll just throw this first one to you, John, I think. Mm, uh, the focus system is probably super transferable uh, to use cases without hundreds of sources. Does middleware not offer that? Seems super useful. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> so I can imagine it being very, very useful in other situations. Um, maybe isomorphic games as well, like when you sort of top down fix camera. Yeah, I, I think it's probably a matter of uh, it's it's super useful, but mostly probably in, in uh, games with that sort of camera. Like if, if you're looking at first person shooters yeah. or, or character based third uh, person games, um, there's other ways you can do these things. You probably won't have these specific cases where you have your you know certain number of loud units who move together or not together. It's, it's mm. probably still a fairly rare thing in, in the vast majority of games. I'm, I'm guessing that's why it's maybe not the highest priority for um, yeah. middleware providers. Uh, but, but it's something that like we wished, obviously, you know, you know why is FMOD could do outside, of, you know, just straight off the bat. But I think the key part of that system was the logic that's behind it, you know, whether it's moving and, and stuff. Yes, you could probably do that at a middleware level, but again, would everybody benefit from it? Would every game benefit it? Is it, is it high enough on the mm. sort of priority for them to develop? So, um, plus us doing it in-house is like, uh, you know, we can super tailor, tailor it for the kind of game that we want to make. So, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's a great that. question though. Yeah. And here's another really good one about the focus system. Um, with the focus system, do you take into consideration the action behind the player's camera view uh, to ensure the player isn't missing a critical event? Um, yes and no. Yes and no. I'd say. Um, um, so with with sort of like the Doom players, for example, um, we had a system in place where we had four engine loops, mm -hmm. um, and we always want to basically reserve an engine loop for four entities, so it, it wouldn't basically trigger engine loop number three like three times because you know that leads to phasing and all those are horrible stuff. Um, but that would take into account, you know, stuff that was on screen versus what's, you know, behind. So the stuff that's on screen was more important. Um, I think the focus system as a whole um, doesn't look at stuff that's behind the camera. So, yeah, I mean, it, it won't be affected when it's off, off screen. So it'll be full volume. Well, actually, we apply scalar value. Yeah. To the full view. So you caught me on the hop, basically. Um, <laughs> I should have I should have read the documentation before I came on. Um, no, but the um, um, essentially, yeah, when it's off screen, I think we apply a bit of a scalar value to it so that it's having less of an effect when it's off screen. So say like the dread sawing roars on screen, the one next to it is out of focus. T typically, the one you might one just over your shoulder that's still within the sort of the range of effect that the focus will be happening but because it's off screen it's actually getting a bit of a less effect. I think the thing with uh, these kinds of systems is a lot of the time uh, do we want to 
implement this for a more cinematic experience or do we want player feedback above all else? So it yeah. depends for, with the focus system uh, for uh, Total War Warhammer anyway. Um, it was more of a cinematic uh, intention. So we're, we're actually doing the opposite almost. We're, we're applying azimuth and, and cutting things out of that behind the camera. Um, there's other things we do to ensure you hear critical things. Total War Arena uh, was an example for, where uh, we had a slightly different approach because it was you know, a competitive multiplayer game. Uh, so that's where uh, games like Overwatch do this in a really mm. great way too, where you sort of throw realism uh, or cinematicness out of the window uh, to a degree to really give you play a feedback above all else yeah, uh, so it's always a focus system based on threat and everything so yeah you know so that it all ties into you know the, the, the actual apparent loudness or filtering of a sound is all controlled by a, a whole bunch of logics that you know is, is this thing important to the player because it's all player feedback is king in a game like that which, we, which is what we're trying to do in total war but we're also obviously we, we're trying to make the battles as cinematic as possible so hmm. it doesn't make sense to go as far as you you'd think with certain elements but yeah yeah i think so great question mm. um what else we got um how do you imagine what sound a norsken ice troll makes <laughs> yeah and um, we've got them in, in warhammer for norska don't we? um can't remember we probably do. we do um we do have ice trolls um in norska um and they breathe ice Surprise oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um i mean trolls on the whole um they did a great job with them i mean they sound typically uh as low iq as you'd you'd think a troll would sound like <laughs> and typically quite hungry um but yeah in, in the frost breath attacks they definitely have like an element of, of, of ice breath yeah i think yeah. the the thing with these kinds of thing is uh, it, it's you can get very creative with these things and that's a challenge and a blessing uh the the interesting thing about a franchise like warhammer is you know it's a long established uh thing so we have a lot of lore uh, to draw on we yeah, have we can cool. read loads of uh books and documentation on on you know what these creatures are all about what what their history is and so that uh, like john said that the low intelligence that kind of thing can really inform um what a creature sounds like um what's the difference between managing complexity for a dense battle in total war compared to an open world game for example hmm. I well think, i think the context is is quite a lot different i mean it's typically in an open world game it's all about exploration and you know you still want that level of immersion right but it's mm, at times more gentle i mean i think total war you, you've got that kind of quiet before the storm where armies are getting into position but the battles in in warhammer are actually a lot faster than in games like uh, even thrones of britannia which is is a recent sort of historical mm. edition three kingdoms as well there's a lot more time for armies to maneuver get into position skirmish and um, there's a lot more sort of there's a lot more time for battles to evolve in those historical versus War, warhammer is pretty much like it's, mm. it's straight in and brutal to, to a degree so uh, um and so the difference in managing complexity is yes you you want that brutality in a total war game versus an open world which is you know you might not have quite as much action all the time as you, it's, you might have. i think that the, what it boils down to is the camera uh, mm. more than anything you you and in an open world game if you're talking first person or third person view you you always see everything from the perspective of of one character mm. almost the entire time uh, so you might have loads of units in the game, but you always have your focus position. Uh, in Total War, the camera can go anywhere from looking at one uh, soldier to looking at 5,000 uh, kind of thing. So you have to, it's a different kind of complexity and you have different kinds of challenges. Yeah, I mean, these. like like Anthem, for example, um, there's a really good talk at Develop about, you know, it, the open world environment systems, for example. and they they've made their environment system complex to deal with like you know procedurally placing ambience around and things like that well you know, we handcraft all of our maps because you know a map is a map in our book um you know we, we do everything that way but um so there's there's more complexity in in certain areas and in, in, in open world games where markup for example on maps and reverb zones you know there's a lot more procedural sort of markup that has to be done versus a total war game so there's you and know. you might have some more scrutiny on, on certain details in in a game like that yeah. where you're lingering longer on a lot of details uh where we can get away with a lot going on yeah 
sort of thing probably like Red Dead Redemption 2 you've got a lot more time to soak in yeah. the, the environments yeah. and everything So it has to all work for over a longer yeah. period of time as well um, okay some questions about careers um, what's the designer to programmer ratio you need to be an audio wizard like you two guys um, I think these days it's for, for what we do we're both sound designers there's uh, we're full-on designers pretty much. It, it's always helpful to have some programming knowledge to, yeah. to communicate with other departments um, and to have an understanding of how everything works under the hood. Uh, but these days in, in almost all studios, I'd say, uh, those are two separate roles. You have your audio programmers or other kinds of programmers and you have your full-on sound designers. Middleware like Wise, I think, really pushed that as well. I think, I think some studios are lucky enough to have what you call maybe a technical sound designer who mm. sort of is that bridge between sort of making a system work on from a sound con concept point of view like like the group system for example or the focus system you know they they can imagine how they want to affect their sounds with a certain sort of strategy of code for example um, and then if they can convey that to you know an audio coder I mean there's such a symbiotic relationship between audio code and an audio design you know, there's constantly ideas flowing backwards and forwards and in a, in a sort of healthy working environment, which is, you know, we've got lucky to have three audio coders here on site and one guy in, in Sophia, Divita, yeah. who's, you know, so we're, we're, we're very blessed to have four at the minute. So it's, it, there is a, a role for just audio coding and there is a role for just audio design, but there is this sort of gray area in the middle, which is quite an interesting niche. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, you don't have to be an audio coder to be a, a sound designer, but there is a sort of a broad scope to be, you know, creatively focused, technically focused, um, and coding focused as well, you know, with sort of more hardcore mm. issues, but yeah, that's cool. That's it. Um, next question. I graduated last year with a BSc in audio and music technology. Um, I've had small projects, a short-term internship for game audio, uh, but I'm struggling to get my foot in the door. Any advice or tips you can offer to get a permanent role? It's tough. tough yeah. it, it's tough out there. So good luck. Um, well done on getting your BSc. Um, uh, my advice, I think, would be network as much as possible because it's it's quite a small industry in terms of game audio, and the more you network, the more you know. The more contacts you'll pick up, you know, the more interesting conversations you'll have, the more ideas you'll have about game audio in general. So, not just from a kind of getting a job point of view, but just for your audio career, it's it's always good to network as much as you can. And uh, something that also ties into the next question, um, which just vanished. Um, uh, basically, <laughs> someone asked. Um, how what, what do we look for in a in a traineeship kind of role? Um, it's the same thing for getting a permanent position. I think the most valuable thing is uh, if you can show work, um, even if you've had some, some short-term projects and internships, uh, the easiest thing to do probably is to join game jams and, and to spend some time there, explore systems, figure out how games are put together, how you communicate with other departments and, and, and to have something to show, to, to put in a reel uh, that's an actual not just a, a sound replacement video, but an actual interactive experience like that, that will put you uh, above everyone else uh, in an entry level. I think joining game jams is, is yeah, super, super useful. Because you, you have to come up with creative solutions all the time in game jams as well. I, mean, I have to say, like when I started, I, I did film audio and TV before I got into games and um, because of the technical challenge and everything. and. The technology back when I started, I started doing racing games and it was all XML driven. Um, we didn't have WISE for the first few. We had a really powerful in-house engine to deal with, you know, all the game audio. But it, the technology back then, that was, you know, 10 years ago, is radically, radically different to how it is now with, with WISE and integrating, you know, your own mixing solutions into a game like Total War. So I wouldn't get too hung up on specific technology that exists now, but it's the the thought process behind the nuts and bolts of how game audio works, which will stand you in good stead to, you know, for whatever future technology happens, be it VR and you know AR and everything that's coming is, um, you know, to, to have that sort of technical foundation of how things work is, is good to have as well. Okay, we've got time for two more questions, I think. Um, 
the first one is uh, with all these systems what would a rough workflow about the creation integration using in engine or in the editor look like um, how to phrase but basically uh, do tools engineers make these usable for designers or your audio programmers I think uh, a lot of that comes from the middleware now so mm -hmm. like John just said things have changed very much to large-scale game productions also using middleware like WISE or FMOD uh, or things like that. So uh, ideally a lot of the implementation integration work we do um, you're enabled to do as a designer with these middleware solutions. Yeah, I mean you can profile everything that's going on in WISE and you know, Game Object Explorer and F12 view. You know, you can, you can view everything that's going on but as you've seen with some of the video examples we do have a lot of really useful debug text that we've got and our, our tools engineers you know, help us develop those kind of visualizations to see what's going on you know, on that particular unit or you know so we can, we can expose every parameter that we've got being updated on on any of the units with debug text so those things make it very very useful yeah okay last question will you be at the game audio drinks in london at the end of the month uh well we're both on vgm so we'll yep. get a reminder yeah, we'll and get a reminder. if we can at all make it we'll be there and with that, thanks again for all your questions. Thank you for watching this BAFTA Games live stream and watch this space for future Creative Assembly tutorials. Thank you. Bye-bye.